Well, we're going to begin tonight with the words of two remarkable and brave politicians. They are rare finds in the world of politics because they are not 100 percent dependent on speechwriters. In fact, not at all. They both speak from the heart and the mind in truly beautiful combinations of intellect and determination. The first is President Zelensky who has given his very best interview yet by far to the Atlantic's Jeffrey Goldberg and Ann Applebaum, who knew exactly where to focus their interview. One reason it is President Zelensky's best interview is that there were no cameras present. He said he was more relaxed without TV cameras when he was speaking with his interviewers. We will consider what President Zelensky had to say in our first segment tonight. And in our second segment tonight, you will meet a member of the Missouri House of Representatives. His name is Ian Mackey, and he represents a district in St. Louis. He believes he could never have gotten elected to the Missouri town where he grew up because of the strong anti-gay prejudice in that community. He brought his life experience to the floor of the Missouri House this week, and when he argued against a Republican bill that could limit transgender participation in school sports, no one could possibly have written the speech that he delivered. That speech by Ian Mackey was something that didn't have to be written. He didn't have to write it himself because it just poured out of him in a controlled, righteous fury that is a painful and beautiful thing to behold. It is, I guarantee you, the best and most moving speech of this week in American politics and in most weeks of American politics. We will bring you that speech in our second segment tonight, and Ian Mackey will join us as a guest on this program for what I hope is the first of many appearances. In President Zelensky's best interview ever with The Atlantic, he said he feels like Bill Murray. And it is at moments like that in this fascinating interview that you realize Volodymyr Zelensky is more fluent in American popular culture and, for that matter, British popular culture than any other president in the world, possibly even including Joe Biden. President Zelensky told The Atlantic, quote, I like new questions. He said, it's not interesting to answer the questions you already heard. He is frustrated, for instance, by repeated requests for his wish list of weapons. When some leaders ask me what weapons I need, I need a moment to calm myself because I already told them the week before. It's Groundhog Day. I feel like Bill Murray. Later, President Zelensky's staff followed up that answer with a very specific list of Ukraine military needs now. Artillery, multiple launch rocket systems, armored vehicles, tanks, air defense systems, military aircraft. President Zelensky says that the leaders of the countries he is asking to supply weapons do not feel the urgency level he feels. Quote, they just live in a different situation. As long as they have not lost their parents and children, they do not feel the way we feel. He makes the comparison to the conversations he has with the extraordinary defenders of Mariupol, the besieged port city where 21,000 civilians may have been killed so far. For example, they say, we need help, we have four hours. And even in Kyiv, we don't understand what four hours are. In Washington, for sure they can't understand. However, we are grateful to the U.S. because the planes with weapons are still coming. President Zelensky showed more of his work history in entertainment and comedy in this interview than in any previous interview. Before he became president of Ukraine, his film and television production company had offices in Moscow as well as Ukraine and viewers in countries all over the region. But now, he says, Russians are completely cut off from any information that could change their minds about what Vladimir Putin is doing, including comedy. President Zelensky said, People he used to work with in Russia, people he knows in Russia, have changed. Quote, become more brutal. That surprises him. He said, quote, it's the North Korean virus. Putin has invited people into this information bunker, so to speak, without their knowledge, and they live there. It is, as the Beatles sang, a yellow submarine. President Zelensky said that people can't survive without a sense of humor. 
quote, without a sense of humor, as surgeons say, they would not be able to perform surgeries to save lives and to lose people as well. They would simply lose their minds without humor. In the best direct question asked of President Zelensky, the reporters asked, is Putin afraid of humor? Very much so, Zelensky said. Humor, he explained, reveals deeper truths. Jesters were allowed to tell the truth in ancient kingdoms, he said, but Russia fears the truth. Comedy remains a powerful weapon because it is accessible. Complex mechanisms and political formulations are difficult for humans to grasp, but through humor, it's easy. It's a shortcut. There are times when President Zelensky can only laugh at the absurd things that Vladimir Putin and his ally, President Alexander Lushenko of Belarus, say about Ukraine. Quote, Putin and Lukashenko, they make it sound like some kind of political Monty Python. President Zelensky says that eventually the Russian people and new Russian leaders will have to do what Germany did after World War II. Quote, Zelensky says they are afraid to admit guilt. He compares them to alcoholics who don't admit that they are alcoholic. If they want to recover, they have to learn to accept the truth. Russians need leaders they choose, leaders they trust, leaders who can then come in and say, yes, we did that. That's how it worked in Germany. President Zelensky said that this Easter weekend will be different in Ukraine. Quote, people usually pray for the future of their families and their children. I think that today they will pray for the present just to save everyone. With the Russians planning for attacks in eastern Ukraine on Easter weekend, President Zelensky said, I cannot understand how a Christian country, the Russian Federation, will be killing people on these very days. This is not Christian behavior at all, as I understand it. On Easter, they will kill and they will be killed. If I could change one unchangeable thing in American politics, I would ban all speechwriters. And then politicians would have to tell us what they really think without professional writers doing it for them. Our next guest would have no problem with that. Ian Mackey, a St. Louis Democrat, is a member of the Missouri House of Representatives. He delivered a speech this week that is the most eloquent and most moving speech of this week in American politics and maybe this year. No one could have written this speech for Ian Mackey, and he didn't have to write it for himself. It simply burst from him in a controlled mix of pain and strength and truth and hope. You have never seen two minutes and 13 seconds of speech making like this. Republican Missouri State Representative Chuck Basie has a history, some might say an obsession, with introducing anti-LGBTQ legislation. Last year, when he was defending one of his bills, he told a story about his brother, who is gay. On Wednesday night, in the Missouri State, State House, Representative Ian Mackey began his remarkable speech in opposition to the bill by reminding Basie about his brother. Do you remember your remarks on the floor last year when you brought this up? Um, it would, you'd have to give me a specific. I mean, I made a lot of remarks last sure. year. So I recall a story you told about your brother. Okay. And I remember you said that your brother called, or that your mother called you, I believe, to tell you that your brother had some news that he was afraid to tell you. Okay. And your brother wanted to tell you that he was gay, didn't he? Um, he was uh, expressing that to the family, and he thought that, uh, that we would hold that against him and not let my children be around him. Why do you think he thought that? I, I don't know. I, it, uh, it never would have happened, I'll tell you that. My, right. uh, my, my kids at that, that point in their life adored my, uh, my brother. Can I tell you, if I were your brother, I would have been afraid to tell you too. 
Well, I'm sorry. I would have been afraid to tell you, too, because of stuff like this. Because this is what you're focused on. This is the legislation you want to put forward. This is what consumes your time. I would have been afraid to tell you, too. I was afraid of people like you growing up, and I grew up in Hickory County, Missouri. I grew up in a school district that would vote tomorrow to put this in place. And for 18 years, I walked around with nice people like you who took me to ball games, who told me how smart I was, and who went to the ballot and voted for crap like this. And I couldn't wait to get out. I couldn't wait to move to a part of our state that would reject this stuff in a minute. I couldn't wait. And thank God I made it. Thank God I made it out. And I think every day of the kids who are still there, who haven't made it out, who haven't escaped from this kind of bigotry. Gentlemen, I'm not afraid of you anymore because you're going to lose. You may win this today, but you're going to lose. And joining us now is Missouri State Representative Ian Mackey. Thank you very much for joining us. I just saw this video a few hours ago, and we went into overdrive to try to get you to be with us tonight. Uh, tell us about the moments leading up to that speech and, and what brought you to that point uh, to decide to deliver those remarks. Well, I think we have a problem with... Ian's connection. Go ahead, Ian. Can you hear me? Sure, okay. sure. So, yes. So, um, yeah, so that, you know, that was, um, this is an issue we knew we were going to end up debating at some point this year. Um, this is an issue that, of course, has been uh, brought up in legislators around, legislatures around the country. And leading up to this, uh, we saw that Representative Basie had filed this amendment on a relatively unrelated bill pertaining to elections in our state. And I had asked the floor leader if he wouldn't mind uh, walking over to Representative Basie and asking him to stand down on this. This was an issue that wasn't related to elections. This was a time where we didn't want to have this fight. We were working pretty cohesively by, in a bipartisan way as a body that afternoon. The floor leader went over and um, talked to Representative Basie, tried to ask him to step down. Looked like he was contemplating that. Um, the speaker wanted this to go ahead, however. Um, and, and, you know, I've had private conversations with Representative Basie before this speech, uh, before this moment on the floor where I made it clear uh, that, you know, if we were going to do this out in the open, if we were going to do this in public, if this was something that, uh, we were going to debate on the floor that it was going to get deeply personal and that it was going to be um, a serious moment. And that, you know, this is something that I thought we should keep off the table. This is, you know, an issue that poisons the well. Um, he, Representative Basie and I work on so many issues together in a bipartisan way that is productive for our state. Um, and this issue just poisons the well. And so, you know, I tried several times to avoid this discussion and avoid this debate, but at the end of the day, that wasn't my call. And so what, what happened, happened. Uh, you moved from Hickory County, Missouri uh, to St. Louis. Uh, I think uh, you couldn't possibly have been elected uh, for, in Hickory County, according to what we heard about Hickory County today. And you talked about in your speech, uh, you think every day about the kids who are still there uh, in Hickory County, the kids who haven't made it out, uh, who haven't escaped from this kind of bigotry. Uh, what do you want those kids to know about what their future can be? You know, I do think about them every day, every single day I think about them. And, you know, whether they're in Hickory County or Dallas County or Barry County or some other rural parts of our state or of our country, uh, you know, I want them to know that there will come a time. Um, there will come a time where they will find people who accept them, where they will find people who love them. And, you know, I had immediate family members who were supportive and who loved me. Um, and who welcomed me and who took me as I was. Um, but, you know, and, and like I said um, to Representative Basie, I had folks who outwardly were, were kind and supportive, but who, you know, when asked to decide the course of public policy, chose to treat me as a second class citizen. Uh, just know that there are so many places where that's not the case. And um, please, before you do anything else, wait and reach out for help. Uh, there's so many resources. There's so many people who want to help. Um, there's so many people who want to be there for you and, and just let them um, and just know that there are people um, in public office 
uh, people I work with in the state of Missouri and people all across the country who are doing everything they can every day uh, to make sure that your rights are just as equal as Representative Basie's or anyone else's. What were you feeling uh, when you in those those two minutes and 23 seconds that we, we just saw where you were summoning up your entire life experience for this moment? You know, uh, it's something I had thought about saying for a long time. Um, it's something I've told several people privately. You know, it's something I talked to friends of mine about, um, uh, acquaintances and friends who grew up in similar uh, situations and circumstances. Um, you know, I serve with other people um, who've been through this. And, you know, I ask uh, these kids and their families to come to the Capitol over and over and over. I beg them to come and share their stories. I And I... You know, I tell them that I know it's hard. And until that moment, I didn't realize just how hard it really is, because that was my time to tell my story. And I realized that I finally took a little bit of my own advice. I realized the impact it had, and I hope that it inspires so many more people, um, kids and parents out there to do the same. Fintan O'Toole, your latest uh, piece for the Irish Times, you, you uh, look at this threat to democracy, which this war is, Vladimir Putin trying to crush his neighboring uh, democracy, and you make the point that this is a, a phenomenon that we're seeing around the world, that this, this challenge, this, this, uh, this challenge to democracy is not just uh, there. And you've isolated, you've isolated a cause that, that uh, is new to me and very compelling when you say the molten core of this crisis of democracy is that capitalism itself has gone feral. Capitalism has evolved to be at least as compatible with oligarchy and autocracy as it is with democracy. And that takes me back to the days when uh, the the walls were cracking and there was so much optimism in the United States, in the foreign policy community, especially because finally Levi's and Coca-Cola were making their way into the Soviet Union and they felt, well, the clock is ticking on the regime. Uh, once uh, the Soviet citizenry uh, and also in China, once they get the taste of these amazing fruits of American capitalism, they're going to want that, that life for themselves. Therefore, presto, democracy. Turns out we've discovered something else. Very sadly, we have, you know, which is, uh, and this is really very profound, I think, because mm. for hundreds of years, really, you know, a lot of the political theory and the philosophy of you know, what does it mean to be modern was basically saying, well, look, if you're going to have capitalism, you have to have the rule of law which means you have to have an independent judiciary, but also you have to have some kind of democracy because people have to consent to the law. And then also you have to have a kind of free flow of information and truth because actually capitalism needs innovation. It needs science. It needs you know people debating things and, and coming up with new ideas. Uh, and what we've found really is the collapse of that idea. And I, I, I completely admit that I bought into it too. I mean, I, I completely believed... 15 years ago, you know, that there was an inevitability about the way in which China would develop and Russia would develop. Uh, and now what we're seeing, of course, is that both China and Russia have become more autocratic, more authoritarian, more repressive, more brutal. Um, and they're still functioning, in, you know, as kind of quasi-capitalist societies very well. And so what we have to ask ourselves is, you know, what's gone wrong with our idea of how capitalism works? And I think it goes back to a very basic thing, you know, which is that a lot of people are very, very happy to make an awful lot of money uh, and have no responsibility towards society. You know, if you, if you just take the very simple thing of why were the Russian oligarchs able to hide their money and create this vast offshore Russia in the West, they were able to do it because they were exploiting systems that we created to allow our you know, super rich people to hide their money and move it around and and have it through shell companies where nobody could really tell what the what the beneficial ownership of these places was. So so we ourselves and our the, the corruption of our sense of, of of a responsible capitalism or a capitalism kind of rooted in the in the common good 
I think has contributed hugely to the creation of these monsters that now really threaten democracy itself.